mankind and I've found my purpose in life and I'm meaning and value and there's you know all those nice things that we all want to achieve in life and stuff and great so the scorpion says any deal is better than no deal you know give more com evidence at the commission and survive and just put the other guys under the bus right or whatever it is or go to Dubai right so anyway, it jumps on the back of the frog and it's swimming along, enjoying life. They talk and they realize they don't have much indifference. It's like the generals and DDUs getting together and realizing, hey, we actually are the same person. We're not different, right? So just as they seem to reach the other side, the scorpion stings the frog. And the frog bloats up with poison and starts to disappear under the water. It can't keep up. And he says, why did you do this? Now I'm going to die. And you're also going to die. You know, what was the whole thing of saving you? And disappears under the water and as it also scorpion also is disappearing out under the water it shouts out I can't help this I'm a scorpion and this is my nature now you might say what's this got to do with us here in Crescent in the general section at some time you might have before you got here been accused of being like a scorpion isn't it and everyone else is like a frog and you sometimes but felt like a frog and everyone's a scorpion or sometimes you felt like a frog and everyone treated you like a frog and just various permutations, isn't it? So we're going to look at those scenarios that make you end up in these negative situations, and even though you try to help, negative situations, all those kind of things. So as much as you came here for the amazing food, and I learned something today because one of my patients was eating something different. I said, what was that? He says, go for the halal option. It's always better. And I learned something new at Crescent, right? Than the usual food. It looked okay too, <laughs> right? But then again, okay? Tell them every, we all become Muslims overnight, right? Anyway, as much as you came here for the food, you've come here for your medic, uh, your, the, whatever you're going through mentally, emotionally, isn't it? So one of the things, how are you feeling? What, what are you feeling? What did you feel the day you came to Crescent in terms of your moods and emotions? Uh, so I'll write it down as fear, right? What else were you feeling? Depressed, I think. Did you say that, right? Excuse me? Overwhelmed, yeah. What else? Confused. Confused, yeah. What else? How was your decision making? Like, I know where I want to go in my life, or it was all messed up, isn't it? So it was indecisive, isn't it? What else you were feeling? Guilty, Guilty yeah. Unsure, isn't it? Helpless. Helpless. In fact, with the list, it goes helpless, hopeless, useless, worthless, isn't it? L everything under the sun. How's your coping skills? Low, isn't it? Anxious, isn't it? All right? Is, is everyone telling you what to do or you tell them what to do? Everyone's telling you what to do, isn't it? So it's like you will take your meds now. You will see your doctor. You will do this. You will do that. So it's me less than others, isn't it? You agree, you feel you have no control, isn't it? And what else you feel? You, you feel completely, absolutely abused, isn't it? All right, what else? Uh, and you feel completely weak, stuck, and stagnant, isn't it? All right, I'll write the word stuck here. Good space or bad space? We can fill this whole board up with words. In fact, another word I have to put here is victim, right? You're completely feeling a victim of the situation, circumstance, uh, person, people, anything and everything, isn't it? Not a good space to be in, right? And it's like, if I write it down, it's like, or draw it, it's a pendulum that's stuck on one end, isn't it? In this negative space, right? And you agree, does it give you energy being in this space or take away energy? Not just, it really sucks the energy out of you, isn't it? It completely overwhelms, overburdened, probably how that frog felt when it was uh, in this, been bitten, isn't it? Or just this general state of that frog compared to the scorpion, you agree? And you agree, it was a very stressful space to be in, right? Just completely overwhelms you, overburdens you. You come to Crescent and you just have no energy whatsoever, right? Even to get out of bed is difficult. Getting up in the morning is difficult. Going through your work is difficult. Leth lethargy, you're not just enjoying anything and everything you do. You agree? All right. So as much as you're in that negative space, uh, what if I said to you, every moment you're trying to break out of that negative space, isn't it? All right. How do I know, how do you know that you're trying to break out of this negative space? What are you doing to break out of it? 
Excuse me? You came here, but even independent of coming here, before you came here, while you're sitting in your room sometimes, while you're in here, over the months, even years, that you've been dealing with that situation, you were trying to get out of the space. What were you doing? What do you naturally do, instinctively do, to break out of that space? You, accepting of your, do you accept, oh, I'm depressed, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless, I don't feel good. Yeah, but something interesting all of you guys are saying, at the end of the day, your mind is thinking. What is your mind thinking about? What is it trying to think and achieve? The mind, yes, the mind sees it has a problem. It's got a Mursa problem. This is like a crazy problem, isn't it? the mind naturally then says, I need to find a solution. Isn't it? Did it find that solution? Did you like, before you got your hallelujah, this is it? No, isn't it? And the, beyond that as well, is that no matter how, it's not like on the first day, second day, given people are giving you inputs, or first week, second week of your stay here, people are giving you inputs that hallelujah, here's the solution to your problem. It didn't work out that way, isn't it? You agree? All right? It's not like someone's running down the corridor saying, just this is the answer to life, isn't it? And you wonder even after three weeks whether you'll have the answer to life, isn't it? You agree. All right? Because why? If you take what Einstein said, he, he put it in a different way. He didn't suffer from depression, but he was struggling with other problems, right? Like theory of relativity or whatever. He says, if you approach a problem, imagine the square as being the problem. If you approach the problem with your old way of thinking, where do you end up? at the same problem. He says along the lines of expand your consciousness, your, your being, to find the solution that lies ahead. He doesn't say expand your thinking. He doesn't say expand your, take antidepressants. He says expand your thinking to find the solution. All right, or, or expand your consciousness. And one wonders what he's talking about, but it's fascinating because it's, it's something very interesting. It's along the lines of something I read this morning, which I thought was quite interesting. He says, it's from a, a, a Western author quotes from an ancient scripture. He speaks of a, a crow sitting on a palm tree, coming to land on a palm tree. And as a result, a coconut falls from the palm tree. So the question comes up, did the, is it because of the co uh, crow that the coconut fell off the palm tree? Possible. Possible, to some extent, was that the only reason? No, they maybe have other reasons. The wind blew. A beetle was eating away at that uh, uh, stem that connected the palm, the coconut, isn't it? All right. Uh, various other factors. It was mature, ripe enough to fall from the palm tree. And just that one slight pressure. S numerous factors. But you, we human beings look for A causing B. Because of an action, there's the reaction. Because of a problem, there has to be a solution. But we don't see the full extent of the problem. Isn't it? We don't see the numerous factors that come into play that created the problem, and therefore we come with a solution that not necessarily deals with the solution. Problem. Isn't it? It's, does that make sense? So someone comes and punches you in the face. Not nice, isn't it? But you immediately we react to the person that punches us, not to the maybe the five people that urge the person to do that. Does that resonate? You know, it reminds me of something interesting. A couple of friends were playing football, and there's a one guy standing to the side on his cell phone, one of the friends, and the other guys were trying to, all the guys were urging the one guy with the ball to kick it at the guy on the cell phone, right? As in hit him on the head, right? They didn't do that. But it wasn't him, the kicker. The kicker was the guy who would do anything someone told him to do, right? But there were the other two or three people that were urging him on who were the real instigators, right? Fortunately, someone said, no, 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 don't do that, one person, right? But it was interesting that it took about three or four people to urge the person to do something that was not nice. Does that make sense? So it's interesting how limited we see a problem. So as much as your mind's over, working overtime, we recognize it doesn't come up with the solution. And another way of describing the mind working overtime, trying to find the solution, is the fact that you agree when you are depressed, your mind is like a storm. Doesn't it? It's flying all over the place. It's crazy. And what we all want to do with that storm 
is we want to get the ocean to the point. Let's imagine it's an o the storm is over an ocean. And it's crazy, isn't it? The waves are going crazy. There's tidal waves. There's everything and anything under the sun. Is that we want to get that ocean stilled. Isn't it? But what happens with our oceans is that someone just throws a pebble. We are gone, isn't it? Those ripples are gone everywhere. We have to still the mind. And beyond just stilling the mind, it will be amazing to reach a state where your ocean is like ice. That no matter what someone throws at it, it bounces off. You agree? At the moment, though, our mind, our waves, our ocean is recipient to any disturbance whatsoever. It throws, completely throws us. You agree? So we need to try and move out of that space, right? And what if I said to you every moment, as we said, we're trying to break out of the space, and you, you agreed we didn't succeed, right? But you are working overtime to try and get out of it, isn't it? Your mind is trying to work, get out of the space. And yes, you do swing. This pendulum does swing. But rather than, and you might try to snap out of it, isn't it? You might behave impulsively. But rather than going into a better space, where do you end up? I'm going to say you're more likely to become irritable, isn't it? Frustrated. What else do you feel when you're in this space? Anxious. Anxious again, and a bit more anxious. Yeah, what else? You said something? Angry, isn't it? You're more likely to shout or scream at people around you. And you may not be shouting and screaming with people around you, but you're shouting and screaming on the inside, isn't it? Isn't it? That war is going on. You're more likely to fight and become harmful towards who? Towards yourself and others around you, isn't it? You're more likely to behave obnoxiously and arrogantly. You agree? Yeah. All right? You agree this is also not a good space, though, isn't it? Yeah. All right? The other thing we must put here is as much as you, me, less than others, everyone's telling you what to do, on this side, it's me greater than others. What's the difference? You don't tell me what to do. I will tell you what to do. You, who the heck are you? Why do I need these meds? I'll sort out my life myself. You agree? At that point where you had no control on that side, on this side you've lost control. Isn't it? If someone's shouting, screaming, fighting in the corridor, we say they've lost it, isn't it? All right? As much as you're abused on that side, on this side you are abusive, isn't it? Again, towards yourself, towards others, we can add more words here. You are dangerous, you are violent, you are fighting, shouting, screaming, overwhelmed, bitter, desperate, isn't it? towards yourself and others. You agree? Good space or bad space? Bad. bad. So we agreed both spaces are bad. This is also stressful, isn't it? So what has happened? We've got two negative spaces and we're trying to get out of it. Let me ask you, what's the fundamental difference between the two ends of the pendulum? Nothing. You're right, they're both negative, but there's something that differentiates the two. There you're not in control. You no control. This one you lose control. Yeah, you are yeah, in a manner of speaking. But someone's shouting and screaming in the corridor and everyone's walking past them. Are they in the driving seat? In your mind you think you're in the driving seat, but you've actually lost control. So Isn't it? You think you're in control, but you're not. It's, it, I, I like what you're saying because we, we shout and scream to gain control. But actually, you lose respect. In the, yeah, and then you might, no one cares sometimes. If you're shouting and skewing, like, yeah, there's, you're doing the usual thing. And the only way you actually can have control if you shout and scream, if you have some assumed power because of position or status or the fact that you're the parent or something to that extent. You understand? But if you someone shouting and scream, yes, I saw this today, sadly. It's like someone in the middle of the road, in the side road where I live, um, with a huge stick, not well, well, you can see he wasn't well dressed, but he looked a bit out of it, literally in the middle of the road, walking. And I, like, and I was fortunately going in the opposite direction, shot past, where I realized this is not good news. And the other cars were already piling up and going, not stopping, adhering to the fact that this guy was wielding the stick, they were driving around him. 
You understand? He was shouting and screaming. He was obviously on this side, completely out of it for whatever reason. And they were just driving around him. He's lost control in his effort that he thinks he's in control. He did to some extent have control because cars had to drive around him and no one stopped and says, how dare you do that? What, where, how? You know? So, you know? so this is what happens, isn't it? So go, both are negative spaces, right? And we agree we don't want to be on one or the other, right? By a show of hands, how many of you are more on the right side, the, the passive side? And how many are on the aggressive side? Okay, and some of us are flying between the two, right? And some of us, did you just wake up one morning and decide to be on that side? Yeah. What happened? Too much. What, yeah, what too much of what? Yeah. Excuse me? Events, yes. Events, yeah, yeah. You were saying, yeah. Uh, too much of events, situations, circumstances. What is the source of all those things you mentioned? In ninety-nine percent of the cases, yeah. What is the source of the external trauma? What is the source of the traumas in your life? In most situations, over the years as a doctor, I've seen. Your actions generally can be a consequence. If you win the lotto, you're not going to get depressed. I hope not. If you do, come see us. We'll, we'll partake. We'll all share. All right? What, uh, what, what is the source? Yeah, in relationship to what? Was it the pain drying on the wall? Yeah, but you lost power in relationship to what? Yes, but we're not getting to the source of 99% of the reason you most of us are here. Trauma. What's the source of the trauma? Was it the weather? By what? The dog? Human beings. 99% of the situations, trauma, events in your life, circumstances is human gener generated. It's person and people. Even here, we're sitting with visors and masks. We don't, we don't say COVID, bad COVID. We say we blame people, isn't it? 99% of the situation, circumstances, events in your life are human generated, are person and people. Not that they did it, your perception of it, as you were saying, right? Some, that guy stopping on the road, waving his hands, no one really gave him much power, so they don't allow him to affect his day their days, you understand? As much as he's in a negative space, you understand? You, you don't give him power so he doesn't impact on you too much, unless he really took that stick and hit your car, then you cheesed off with him, all right? But whether he's shouting and screaming in the road, verbally abusive, sadly, you couldn't bother because you don't give that person power. But the people in your lives, even though they didn't necessarily get verbally abusive, sometimes they say the most subtle thing to you that throws you off for a couple of days. You agree? All right, so that's the, we give persons and peoples in our lives power. All right, and what you might say 99%, in the other 1%, sometimes we may have a personal illness that doesn't, may not be dependent on people, isn't it? But then we get cheesed off with people because they don't support us during that illness, right? Or you can have a natural disaster like the floods or earthquake or in this day and age to COVID, all right? But what I've seen 99% of the cases, it's person and people, right? And person and people in, two themes of Crescent where people come in with is relationships, which is what we're dealing with this week, and work, isn't it? Where we struggle. And it's not your relationship or at work. is not about the walls or even the fact that they give you a little stationery. It's the people that you're with that determine whether the place rocks or messes you up completely, isn't it? It's the, you know, something interesting. I'm sure some of you got kids and the whole thing is that to determine which is the best school for your kids, isn't it? And as parents, we walk around, we check out the facilities, we meet with that headmaster, and we meet with the, what you call it, the principal of that primary school, and all these various divisions within the school. And we might meet the teacher even, oh, hi, your kid's coming. Does that determine whether you're, for your kid, what 
uh, that that school is a good school. The swimming pool, the three t uh, tennis courts, the cricket ground, the amazing grass, the fact that they wear the funky uniforms. What determines for the kid whether the school is good? What determined for you whether the school was a good or bad experience? The teacher? Values. Values, but it's the 20 kids you hung out with. I'm choosing a number. It was that group of friends that made your life wow. Oh, whoa, whoa. Isn't it? You remember that because that's what it's about. Not the fact that your school, well, in my time, it had broken windows. Those toilets sucked, literally. Right? You, but it was about the group of friends. Isn't it? And perchance I did change schools to a more, you could call it aesthetically pleasing school. It was about the group that you hung out with that was most important. Does that make sense? Because as a kid, it's very important that you belong. It wasn't about the fact that we had three or four cricket teams and all those kind of things. It was about that group of friends and that teacher. It's about humans. We are social animals. What determines your environment is the people you hang out with. Isn't it? So what's interesting, if you want to be here, what you just said to me, let's draw you here, perchance you said you're on the depressed side more so. What you're telling me, if you are here, and you said you are there, and it's person and people determined, isn't it? 99%. That what you're telling me, in order for you to be there, there has to be someone who's an opposite and equal force on the other side. So for you to be, let's take a word, a victim, there has to be a victimizer. In order to be abusive, there has to be someone that you abuse. In order to feel me less than others, there has to be someone or some people that are me greater than others. Does this resonate? In order to say you have lost control, you have to have people who have no control, wherever that is. All right? Yeah, there's a there. In order to say there's a frog, you have to find a scorpion. In order to be a nail, there has to be a hammer. In order to be a boxer, there has to be a punching bag. You agree? Now, we, you know in your life, the people that you might see as the scorpions, the frogs, the nails, the hammers, all those things, right? Given you on that side, You've identified a whole lot of people that fit in on the other side, right? In your life that messed you up. Isn't it? Or have at some level irritated you, frustrated you, but you may not show it, isn't it? All right. Because irritation and frustration hopefully is a milder form of where you get to anger, isn't it? You might get irritated and frustrated with your boss. You don't tell him, isn't it? You play, you're the victim to the boss, right? So what's interesting, in order for you to be on one end, you have to have someone or some people on the other end. And in your minds, you've identified a whole lot of people that are on this side, right? And then we'll give a scenario. Perchance we all walk outside, we sit there, we have a coffee break, and we invite all those people that fit in on this side. And they do come, because we give them free food or whatever, right? And they come and sit in this room, and I show them the exact same model, okay? And I say, you, out there, invited them into this room. In relationship to you, are they the victim or are they the victimizer? Are they going to say we victimizers? Are they, say, are they going to say they're the abusers? Are they going to say they're the in relationship to you? We invite the Guptas, who we all feel a victim of, right? Well, some of us do. I can, right? Are they going to say, geez, we took the money and ran. Yeah, South Africa, what are you going to do? Catch us, try and get us out of Dubai if you can. Are, are, is that what they're going to say? No, what are they going to say? Excuse me? Play victim. Everyone in the Zondo Commission, do they sound like victimizers? I took the money, you can't catch me. Well, some of them you can't catch. <laughs> huh? What are they playing? Victims, sad, how dare you do this to me? This is wrong, that guy's wrong, the judge is wrong, that, everyone's wrong. I don't have so much money. Excuse me? Someone paid me to do it, he did it, not me. They did it, isn't it? We got this new expression in South Africa. Throw them under the bus, the bus is not big enough. Throw a bigger bus, isn't it? I got no proof, that person's wrong, isn't it? Everyone's a victim, huh? Isn't it? So who the heck is right? That's up to Judge Zondo, right? <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? It's fascinating. I'm not even looking at it. I'm just looking at the mindsets of 
how we behave, isn't it? Welcome to planet Earth. Everyone sees themselves as victims. From presidents, I'll say presidents as in plural, down, everyone's a victim, to the guy on the street, isn't it? No one claims I did it, isn't it? Because everyone's a victim. This is our mindset, sir. We all, yeah, so interesting, as much as we say, this person, that person, this situation, that people, this is the reason I feel depressed, hopeless, victim. No, they don't see it that way. No one sees it that way. Everyone is seeing themselves as a victim of some situation, circumstance, person, and people. Isn't it? So as much as, by the way, so you on this side, so where are these people? Yeah, you ask. It's a totally true that everyone is a victim. Everyone sees themselves as a, most of us see ourselves as victims. Yeah. We find it hard times to accept what we've done. Yes, but if you, I don't, yeah, but then we must not look at it in isolation. What made us opposite of victim rather than saying victimizer is let's say use the word perpetrator. Yeah. Right? In order to perpetrate something, you must be at a, which is negative, you must see yourself in a position of scarcity. Okay? Does that resonate? That means if you decide to, the, there's a bank, there's some money, you can grab it and go, right? Then you agree at some level, someone might accuse you of being a victimizer, right? A perpetrator. But what makes you take the money? You, because you come from a position of scarcity. What created that position of scarcity? In your mind, at some time, and you may give a justifiable event, in your life, maybe not having enough food on the table, maybe uh, you were deprived, you see yourself as a victim. Does that resonate? Yeah? Yeah? So why do you not in a position of scarcity, but you still do? All of us do. May not be in a position of scarcity, because scarcity is a relative term. You may have had enough, but you just feel deprived. Not enough. You understand? You may provide your kid with absolute necessity, but they may have a mindset of scarcity. All of us do at some level have a, a mindset of scarcity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's enough, as Gandhi said, there's enough for your, what you need, but there's not enough for your greed. Yeah. Right? And I'm not, it was something interesting, I work with ho uh, children from homes, right? As in, uh, they looked after in a home, okay? And I won't forget the one woman says, I mean, they had ample food. She was sponsored, you know, you, know, you get the sell-by dates with some of these uh, supermarkets, okay? And one of the interesting things was that, you know, as soon as they reach the sell-by date, they, they give it away, right? So they probably eat better food given the high end of the, <laughs> you know what I'm talking of, right? Because you and I will still eat, I eat the food post sell by date, just as it tastes okay, right? You, you know, you agree, right? It's not about sometimes we grew up where you just didn't judge it by its sell by date, right? Kids of today, oh, I can't eat the fruit anymore and it looks all right, but to you, you can eat it, right? So these kids were eating food that was about to expire, but as per sell by date, but they had good food. So there was loads of food, all right? In fact, I was, I was probably invited, I think, once or twice to partake of dinner or something like that. There was loads of food. But it was something fascinating because a lot of these kids had come from homes where there was absolute scarcity. Even though they'd been there for a year, they were still on the first, you know, first offering, first serve, second serve, you know, of food. They would still pile their plates up high. Even though she said you can come the second or the third or the fourth time, they would still pile their plate up high the first time. Because you never know, you may not get again. It was so wired into your brain. You understand? And some of us, like, and all of us, carry some level of scarcity mindset, even though we may grow up in abundance. South Africa, generally, what do you think we have? Because since you raised this thing of uh, you know, scarcity versus abundance, right? Do Generally, our South Africans, what do we grow up as? A scarcity mindset or abundance mindset? There's a resounding scarcity. Why? I assume you'd like to think some of us have food. All of us have food on the table. Yeah, because we're surrounded by, it's not enough. 
people are taking, and you're thinking, geez, why are they taking? Because they, they assume there's not enough, and they're not, not taking like a rand, two rands, as we call it in South Africa. We're taking absolutely like, geez, will you even be able to spend it within your lifetime? No, well, we kind of sometimes get aware because we get sent these WhatsApp videos of people buying the Lamborghini, the Ferrari, the Porsche, isn't it? But the whole thing is it's still not enough, isn't it? And that's the level to which uh, we are being wired to believe that even if you have a billion, it's not enough. Isn't it? So it's creating a scarcity mindset. And then we also create a mindset that you've got to do certain things to achieve it, which may not be appropriate. Let's use that word. Right? So something fascinating. Let's talk about it further. Let's extrapolate it since you raised it. So you agree at some level we're all carrying victim mindsets. Hmm? Now this is very interesting. What's the last decision of power you make in order to be a victim? What's the last decision of power you make to absolutely be a victim? No, not, not, yeah, it's not necessarily about the place. Yeah, it's, it doesn't have to be the place. You said? How do you give control? You know, but there's something you do, as you said, you give control. How do you give that control? Reggie, the lights. Huh? You have to blame. Isn't it? You only give control to others when you blame them. Excuse me? I'll, I will. You, in order to, if, in order for, remember we identified all those people on this side? If we go and interview them and ask them whether you, they are responsible for you being here, will they say yes? No. Well, how did you identify them? You have to blame them. That means that's the moment you give up power. Anyone likes e tolls? <laughs> don't worry. Also, I don't like it. It's not like, yay, party on down, Joburg, purple lights, here we come, isn't it? Even during load shedding, those things are working, huh? Uh, it just occurred to me now, like, gosh, you'll have no lights in Joburg. Look for the purple lights. We know where to land. You know? <laughs> it's right. It works off the ESCOM grid. We will make sure those lights are working. You know? It's amazing, right? And no one likes it, right? What do, who do we blame? Government. Government right? oh, he, and then we'll find Sandral, that CEO. Huh? There was one of them, the ex-CEO, Nazir Ali, right? And it's fascinating because this was in a couple of years ago. I mean, this debate is ongoing. Now we can't bother, right? When it first came out, it was interesting to hear the debates and controversies around the ETOs. And it's something we all didn't sit and have. We are not paying. Everyone independently said they're not paying, isn't it? And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's for another... Hi, come through. Uh, uh, Reggie, the lights, I think. Reggie, the lights. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not sh you know, it's, uh, the whole thing was that there was lots of debates, and it would come on the radio about the ETOs, right? And what was fascinating, because how did when, when we, you know, we have lots of talk stations in Johannesburg, right? And you phoned in upset about the ETOs, right? Because you normal drive on the road in your Hyundai, whatever car, you're driving, you, how did the average person sound when they phoned in about the etos? Excuse me, irate, angry, isn't it? Shout, scream on this side, right? You agree. And then listen to, if you can, the guys who work for Sandra. You know the guys who were saying you had to pay? How do you think they sounded? They sounded like this. You must hear the CEO, he's like, this is not right. We have to have someone to pay this. You know, but South Africans, we're not that, we think of things. We had this discussion earlier. You know this money, as much as you paid, have, can anyone guarantee me that that money was absolutely going for the roads? No. That's a resounding no. Amazing. Gosh, we, come, <laughs> we should run for president. It's, you know that. There's some other things going on, isn't it? You kind of don't, do you trust the system? Isn't it? So the guy coming across and saying this money is for that pothole. Give me. <laughs> but the roads were improved. Yes. Now I'm not going to go into that whole debate. Not going to go into that whole debate. You know, it's not about the roads being improved because there was a presumption that you will pay. Then you realize, flip, these people have a voice. 
you understand what I'm getting at? It's not about the roads being paid, done. It's not about that. It wasn't, we're not going to go into who's right and wrong. Do you work for Sandra? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm being honest. It's not about that. It was about where you end up on which side. And I'm trying to demonstrate mental and emotional states. Fortunately, you decided to think, oh, the roads were improved, so I will pay my ETOs. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but uh, you still feel what you want to feel. You know what I mean? It's, there's so much to it. It's so com but I'm not looking at what you did before, before. Forget, let, let's cut that, uh, uh, sorry, let's focus on my talk rather than <laughs> something else, right? What I'm getting at is your mental and emotional state. And generally, South Africans, Johannesburg people respond angrily. And that organization re responds depressed. Someone else was going to ask something? I'm, let's not, let's do that on the offline, right? We now, you know, you know, because the whole thing is that it's about what it created in you. Now, you might say, let's have that discussion. I'm more interested in what it creates in you. If it creates anger, it's getting your uh, adrenaline going, your cortisol lowering, it's getting you stressed. If you end up a victim of it, you are stressed. But it was all in relationship to asking a practical solution. Look at the debate it created. Fascinating, isn't it? People were like got hyped up. I was wondering anyone had breakfast this morning, right? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's fascinating what it did. By the way, very, given we had this amazing chat, we even want to discuss about they did the roads before, they did it, right? Leave the potholes, let's focus on this, give them a good product, but the, uh, getting out of your house is like, you know, climb, you need a mountain climbing degree because your car goes into a ditch and comes out. That's a different story, right? You had that debate. By the way, where are they, given you on that side, where are they, these people that you said are on the other side? the people you are victims of, all these people that we identify, be it the person on the road, the presidents, the, where are they? Hmm? They're in your mind. Do they even know you exist? No. Yes, you're talking about people fixing the roads. They have no clue what you, who you are. Isn't it? And I'm not even going into another more crazy one. We'll go into it a bit. Just for the emotional side, is that we watch this thing every year. It used to be quite fun because of the emotions it got you going. Like a South Africa's most watched reality show. Which one am I talking of? The State of the Nation Address. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You agree? You got, you, you, then the debate won't stop if I asked you, right? Because it'll be like, there's violence there, right? There's language, right? The only thing missing is the S. You know what I'm talking of, right? <laughs> right? You can't let your three-year-old kid watch it. When my kid was around, he was young, like, Dad, what are you watching? You can't watch this. Why? He says, I saw Granddad watching the same thing. He also had his popcorn out, you know? <laughs> you understand? And you agree, you go through a whole host of emotions, depression, anger, frustration, irritation, isn't it? Do those guys even know you exist? exist. No, but you decided you're going to put them all here and you'll go here. Isn't it? And they, what, would, what are they all pleading? D victimhood, isn't it? You agree and you, you, and you are there or whatever it is, isn't it? You have gone through a whole host of emotions on people that are completely in your mind. Does that resonate? All right. You can, in, in fact, we said they're in your mind. So where are they actually? Yes. But so, you identified all these things, so this is very important, and you said to me, these people are in your mind, so where's all these emotions? So did it have anything to do with the other person? So as much as you might have claimed to be here, you are absolutely here. This is the, the absolute point. All you did is you used someone or some people to trigger something that existed within you. You might say, I'm never there. Perchance you're at work and your boss is giving you hell, right? You agree with your boss, you sit a victim, hopeless, worthless, abused, right? You come home at five, depressed, sad, crazy day at work. You walk home and your kids come running up to you, dad, mom, 
Today, we at school were given a free, you know, whatever, box of paint. And we decided we want to surprise you today, so we painted your uh, bedroom <laughs> and the bed and, you know, arts and crafts. Are you still sitting victim, hopeless, worthless? You, yeah, isn't it? They go into hiding, isn't it? They have to go into exile, right? You agree? What happened? Flip. Because you were sitting here all day, you flying on this end, isn't it? And then you come here, you come to Crescent. This is, I'm giving a scenario, but it's very interesting how we South Africans generally identify. You come here because of your boss, you're depressed, you're hopeless, you're worthless, you're feeling like a complete victim. And you have the family meeting and your partner, husband, wife, children, how do they describe you as? Victim, hopeless, worthless? Angry, shouting, screaming, isn't it? Why do we generally go with this though? But no, I'm really a victim. I'm really sad. I'm not to blame. I'm, you know, what's happened? Because most South Africans, as you said, because we come from a survival mentality, our main identity is our job. We take our identities from our workplace. You possibly hear as well because work is not working out. Isn't it? Be it the COVID, be it the economy, be it issues at work, isn't it? You understand? And like something interesting, because I worked long hours yesterday, the wife just said in passing, oh, the kids, don't worry, you know, we were talking about doing something, they won't see you as they usually don't do. You know, like, oh, God, because I'm working, isn't it? That's my identity, I gotta provide, isn't it? And I'm like, no, and what's interesting, not like, geez, I wanna take off at two in the afternoon to spend time with them, isn't it? Because that's your identity, that's the big deal. Isn't it? That's what we generally draw identity from. Interesting, perchance you don't work and your identity is then as a husband, a mother, or a father, or a sibling, we may not feel that's enough of our identity. And that too can lead to crisis, isn't it? All right, but your current identity may be leading to crisis. Does that explain some of the things we said about blame? Because you have to then blame. You decide someone is responsible for where you are. Okay, in fact, let's expand on this a bit uh, more. In terms of blame, what's the opposite of blame in that context then? In order not to be a victim, what do you have to do? Forgive. Take responsibility. Take responsibility, isn't it? For who? For the okay, you, I guarantee you, most of us in here, after you leave Crescent, will take responsibility for yourselves. Does that guarantee you your life? of complete chill? No, why not? Yes, why are things gonna happen in life? Yeah, because you, you, those people still act weird and crazy, isn't it? You take complete responsibility, you take complete control, but there's people out there, you, you can't, isn't it? Why? What if I said the true answer then is you have to take responsibility for yourself and everyone out there? Yes, but well, how do you take responsibility for yourself and everyone else? How do you choose to react? Yes. How do you take control of... Sorry, wrong word. Yeah? Yeah. So how do you take responsibility for Donald Trump? But it's interesting what your choice of words are because we're equating responsibility with controlling Donald Trump. Can you control him? <laughs> so you're sitting there, just say you're one of those people sitting in the Capitol building and you see this, that, that group coming. You say, I kind of control the guy if you were having a one on one. I'm sure you'll win, right? But can you, how do you take responsibility for Donald Trump? You have a choice to block the person by playing. But there's that mob coming against you. You're driving on the freeway on your left lane, minding your own business, taking responsibility and control for yourself, of yourself and your car, and someone shoots across at speed from the right lane, breaks in front of you. What do you have to do? You have to choose how to react. You have to take responsibility for yourself and them. Very important what we do, we equate responsibility with control. I guarantee you cannot control everyone. The reason you're here is because you lost control or you had no control. Responsibility is not only control. In fact, control is 
You, you year because you have no control, isn't it? Over the environment and person and people. The word I like to use is responsibility is, responsibility is equal to control plus awareness. Control plus observance. A more biblical word would be control plus witness. You have to see things for what they are. Awareness is 99%. You're aware. It didn't necessarily surprise most people that there was a march on the capital, isn't it? It wasn't like, my God, I didn't expect this to happen. You kind of, just interesting, it happened a few days before his thing, end, his reign, should we call it, ended, isn't it? But it happened, isn't it? And if you sometimes listen to some uh, now podcasts and videos of you know, what had happened, people had suggested that this might happen. I think they were just surprised it even happened, even though they suggested this is what it could lead to. You demonstrate awareness. 99% of your life is awareness. Can you tell me what's going to happen tomorrow? Yeah. No, that demands awareness, not control. We try to control the events. Your kid at five, how do you deal with them? They're doing something wrong. Okay, in my case, I control the guy, isn't it? I hold him by his ankles and swing him. No, but I endeavor to control him, all right? You agree? When he's 25, can you control him? No. Might be too heavy to pick up by the ankles, right? And possibly he'd be picking me up by the ankles, right? But you've got to be aware. Huge part of what we're struggling with is awareness. And then when we understand it, we may bring it into our control, but 99% you cannot control, isn't it? Life responsibility is awareness. And sometimes then when things go wrong, it's not about saying we get upset because we blame them because we have no control, but recognize as much as you have no control, it was about you improving on our awareness of the environment. That something will go wrong given the situation and circumstance. You understand? South Africans, not, I'll give you a practical example of awareness, is that you're driving, it's a nice warm day, you pull up at the Malibongwe off-ramp, you've got your windows wide open, someone walk, is walking towards your car, and they don't have a whole bunch of batteries for your cell phone and caps. They're just walking towards your car. What do you do to your windows? Why did you close them? It's a warm day. You're aware of the environment. You, what came to mind that you instinctively closed them? Yeah, so what came to mind? Beyond steel, fear, danger, isn't it? You don't want to be a frog to the circumstances. Isn't it? You don't want, him to, you don't want to be a victim. So, and you didn't even do it. You did it without even looking at him. You did it instinctively. You are so wired. If you're in an American or British environment, someone's walking to your car, it's unusual. They probably think, what is I walking to my car for a year? And even if you're South African, you probably still will close your window because that's what you do. And you may still do it because after 20 years, you're still doing it, isn't it? We see someone pull up at the stop street and they pull up 100 meters before the stop sign. We, can't, we accept these things, right? In another country, they'd be hooting. Why did you stop? Isn't it? We're so aware, you are aware of your environment. As much as it doesn't happen to you and the guy really wants to sell you CDs or DVDs or whatever he had in his coat, you're still aware, isn't it? You demonstrate awareness. Life is about learning awareness of our environment. It's tough because the, you know what do you, we control with? The only organ you can control with is your mind. You can only control something you know. Isn't it? And the thing, a place of knowledge or wisdom is your mind. Awareness, whew, that's a tough one because your mind doesn't know enough to control. Awareness is that instinctive feel that you might feel. Does that resonate? And you have to, and we switch ourselves off from that because that's not logical and rational. Isn't it? But let me ask you this. If you're here at Crescent Clinic, is it logical and rational to be here? No. Well, in the sense of the situation, as we discussed yesterday, no. You didn't want the situation that you hear, right? I hope the food's not that amazing and the company you meet, uh, it's cool, but you know what I mean? It's not the reason you came here, isn't it? So if you look at it, life didn't listen to your logic and rationality or your mind. Your mind, your logic and rationality has to listen to life. That demands learning awareness, isn't it? So as much as we're on this side and the other person's on that side, let's draw it in another way. There's you on this side of the seesaw, and they're there. 
on the other side and you've balanced the seesaw out. So in order for you to exist as your personality and character, you need a person on this side, the opposite and equal person on this side. And remember that game you played as on, on the seesaw where you balance the seesaw out? This is what we're all playing. And then we wonder why we're in imbalance because the, only, the other person is not out there, it's in you. Isn't it? So what's fascinating, another way we say, is how you see the world is how you see yourself. It's a complete perception based on what you developed in your mind. Isn't it? So in fact, someone will ask me, why, Doc, do I end up in such crazy relationships? It's because if you, perchance, you, the relationship ended, you know, it was a crazy scum of the earth relationship, and you go into another relationship, what is generally the nature of the next relationship? It's the same, isn't it? Why? Do we put an ad on Gumtree looking for someone to beat me up? Yes, because we're so caught up in these words. We, we facilitate people being of this world. Isn't it? If you're sitting on this world, you're looking for someone to beat up because this is how you see the world. You agree, but you'll still see yourself as a victim, right? So you're on this side and the other person's on that side. And this is the nature of relationships. We go from one to another to another because we don't let go of this mindset. So if you're sitting on this side and that person sitting on the, that side, right? And you want to achieve balance, peace, all these nice things we want out of a relationship or the situation, how do you achieve it? So what do you got to do on the seesaw? Balance. balance. How do you achieve the balance? Yeah, but what do you do on the seesaw? There's you on that side and the other person on that side. Excuse me? Give and take. Let me ask the question in a different way. It's your 16-year-old daughter. She's here, and the other person, this guy you want to report to the scorpions, is on that side. <laughs> Not report. <laughs> you <laughs> you want to act like a scorpion in front of him, right? And you want to be the hammer and <laughs> or the boxer and make him the punching bag. And she's here, and he's there. Are you going to use those words you just told me, balance? give and take. What are you going to tell her? What are you going to tell her in terms of that guy, given how he treats her? Say it. What are you going to tell her? Balance? Say it. What are you going to do? Yes. Leave her to get the hell out of here. Huh? Why did we struggle to come up with that answer? Well, first of all, you're going to tell her, get the hell out of there, isn't it? Let's acknowledge that. But why do we struggle? Why did we not come up with that same answer for your situation? Because yes, because, you know, doctor, my situation is... Yes, my last resort. That's after you, like lying in that uh, hospital casualty, beaten up. I think you're right, doctor. Maybe I should have left. <laughs> isn't it? Because our situation is so complicated, doctor, the psychologist, the psychiatrist just don't get it, and you're the fifth psychiatrist I'm seeing, isn't it? Because someone needs to get my view of the world, you know, you, you understand? We're so enmeshed in it, we don't see it. You agree? It, it's too complicated. You're still talking to your psychologist, it's your, you're just about to get discharged, and you still got to age 16, and you've got another 20, 30 years to discuss. Because it's so complex, isn't it? But it's interesting, we got the answer to everyone else's life, right? <laughs> But we don't have the solution to ours because we're so enmeshed in our world. This is the only world we know. How the hell do you step out? It's easy to say it, isn't it? With your 16-year-old daughter, hopefully we, some, some groups are shouting, yes, get the hell out of there, isn't it? But with us, you know, it's too complicated, doctor. You don't get it. You know? It's nothing wrong. And I've had a patient describe walking on her hands and knees saying, please don't leave to the guy. You know? And like, I think you need to leave. You don't understand, doctor. You understand what I'm getting at? So it's fascinating. But it's not just you. Anyone and everyone of us are like frogs. They describe if you warm the temperature of the water by one degree to a point where it's uncomfortable, what does the frog do? It doesn't jump. It stays in the water. No, it can't adapt. It gets, you get boiled frogs. You'll have to sell, your, sell it to a restaurant. That you, you, you agree? And lots of us are boiling in water, which is uncomfortable. 
Does, you understand what I'm getting at? I have someone from, uh, who's left South Africa, and he's telling me that he told me the same story I gave. He talks of the boy frog. You are like a boy frog. Okay, that's the perception from the outside. You may have another reason for sticking around. You understand? But yes, 99.9% .9 of relationships, in relationship to what I just said, you may decide not to just up and leave. You might decide not to go. Certain relationships you can never run away from. Your mom is your mom is your mom. Even if you decide you're going to Canada, Perth, Australia, wherever. Isn't it? Your siblings are your siblings. Your kids are your kids. Your relationship with your partner may be for various reasons that you stick around, isn't it? All right? Some relationships, yes, 1% you may leave where they're beating you up physically, mentally, emotionally, right? And there may be reason then to leave. But in most relationships, you can't just up and leave. It may be for you to work on to facilitate a shift, isn't it? So let's look at the middle, as you might have said, finding that balance, give and take, as you called it. If you move to the middle, by the way, if the person persists on one side or the other, what happens to them? They will fall, isn't it? Because they cannot sustain, because there's no opposite and equal force, because you refuse to be their punching bag. And that's where your pendulum is in the middle, regardless of whether they're on one side or the other. Okay? So let's explore that. So if this is me less than others, and that's me greater than others, then what's this? Equal to others, isn't it? And that's passive, and that's aggressive. So what's this? Assertive. What does assertiveness mean in this context? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, it's another way of putting it. It's total, complete acceptance. I like this word respect. Acceptance can also fit for who? For myself and others. Other words we can put here is love towards yourself, dignity, acceptance, humility, compassion, kindness towards yourself. You have to soothe that kid within you. You know that kid that got messed up over the years and believed in scarcity and stuff? You need to sort out the compassion, kindness, gratitude, gratefulness towards that person. Because we spoke of scarcity and abundance. We lack these things, therefore there is scarcity. You agree? That's why we feel it's not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I don't have enough. We all, we like, anyone here gets paid enough? <laughs> In all these years, I'm still waiting for the answer from someone, right? Okay? And no one gets paid enough, isn't it? They always can pay you more, isn't it? And then the owner of the company is like, we don't make enough. You've got to work harder, isn't it? We all have this thing of scarcity mindset. It's fascinating to hear someone say, I make enough, you know, what's her name? I watched this, uh, Julia something, the one acted in Pretty Woman. No, oh yes, yeah, Julia Roberts. How can I forget her name, right? Uh, uh, how dare I, should I say, right? Julia Roberts says she has enough money to live her lifetime two, three times over. Gosh, not many of us, are we still trying to make some money to live through this lifetime, isn't it? All right? So the whole thing is that very few of us have that fortune in South African context of feeling abundant, isn't it? And that then leads us to feeling calm, co uh, complete, let's use the word balance, and free. And even let me use the word control, isn't it? The only way you can control yourself is to feel complete within yourself. Isn't it? We all feel incomplete, and therefore we will always look to our environment to complete us, but geez, we're on a hiding to nothing. Isn't it? That's why we react to things, because we feel incomplete. That means when something happens, we fly to one end or the other. Is it as easy as that to get to the middle, where we free, complete, balance? No. Yeah, and you agree we've got to work on getting to the middle, right? Let me ask you this. Someone says, okay, stick around for three months, three years in Crescent Clinic. No. You'll be sure, you agree, if you, they, you'll be shouting, screaming, fighting, yeah. hopeless, worthless if you had to stick around longer, right? So imagine how Mandela must have felt in his jail cell. Forget three years, ten years into his sentence. You agree he must have felt on one side or the other, huh? 
he describes something very interesting in his book. If you take different parts, he says, I could have gotten very, what's the word, angry at what f- suffering my people were going through. He doesn't say what I was going through. He says what my people, as he said, it's, it's more about what you give rather than what you get. But I chose not to get angry and thereby set myself free. He describes, I kept my head facing towards the sun and my feet walking forward. I decided I could not and would not lose my dignity. What's fascinating was a man who moved, he was described as maybe an angry young man prior to prison. He went to a point where he moved to the middle. He he refused to become a victim of person, people, situation, and circumstances. When he came out of prison, did he look like he needed to come to Crescent and get some Ciprolex? He looked like he was walking in the botanical gardens holding his wife's hand and like in a Bollywood movie, you know? (laughs) If you take away all the crowds, it was like they were singing a song going somewhere, isn't it? The man looked completely chill, and in fact, that was one of the, every movie, there's going to be quite a few movies made, I'm sure, of Mandela. The whole thing is about that scene when he walks out of jail, isn't it? Because the crowds were so much, he got out and he's walking like, he's chilling in the park. Huh? What was wrong with the guy? Did they feed him too good food or what? You know? And he looked robust, isn't it? The big deal about even the fact that they chose that actor, um, was Idris Elba, was about the fact they needed someone who managed, uh, matched his demeanor. Isn't it? Because Idris is a six foot tall, powerful guy, isn't it? You needed someone that could exude that energy. Because what's fascinating, in order to be here, I don't have space, but we could draw another line going up with another ball on top. He had a focus, a purpose, a truth, a goal. Be careful when you don't have those things. As much as you're sitting in the middle, because of our lack of purpose, truth, we allow things on either side to push us to one side or the other. Show me someone who's got somewhere to go and I'll show you someone who's going to move out of this. And the more purpose-driven, that means illogical and irrational, your journey is, the more likely you will stay in the center. If it's a logical or rational path, then people will push you to one side or the other. Because then it's within the mind, but you don't have control of the outer environment. Does that make sense? That means, you know, you know you have to get out of the building. You know how to get out of the building. It's easy. Go up the stairs, turn left, turn right. Okay? And people will mess you around on the way. But if you're going through uncharted territory, you won't let people bug you because your energy is focused on the fact that there's more fear and danger in the uncharted territory that's illogical and irrational, driven by maybe faith and conviction. Because Mandela's journey wasn't logical and rational. I'll spend 27 years in here and then come out. It was completely illogical and irrational. It was fear-driven, but he had to have faith and conviction, isn't it? Do you agree? Because there was no clue where they would end up. You understand? So as much as we speak about that, I'll give you a four-step, five-step process to work through uh, getting out of this mindset. And number one is introspection. What's the big deal about introspection? Why do we not like to do it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you see the good and the bad. Huh? And we don't like no- noticing the bad, but that's part of your growth because that's where you notice where you're scarce. Why we feel incomplete, inadequate. And we hate to acknowledge those things because, gosh, then we're revealing ourselves to the world. Huh? But it's easy to point out the bad on the outside, the etos, the government, this, that, the, you know, the corruption. But to notice the good and the bad inside you, the corruption inside you, all the stuff within you is tougher. But once you acknowledge that, once you're aware of that, the awareness, acceptance, acknowledgement, that's number two. The awareness, acceptance, acknowledgement allows you to dissolve it. And why we don't like to do it as well is to accept and acknowledge, I'll use the word, the truth. But what you gotta do and why we don't like doing it is you gotta view the truth as not brutal, you gotta view it compassionately. Because you viewing brutally is what was inflicted upon you as a child. The person that did something to you was brutal. Because something interesting when you're a kid and you're walking along, enjoying life, innocent, you know, doing your thing, and life whacks you, a person or people whack you, be it your mom, be it physically, mentally, emotionally. The first emotions you feel is embarrassment, humiliation, shame, those kind of things, isn't it? Right? You feel like, geez, what did I do wrong? Eventually, you learn to react with anger because life teaches you you've got to protect yourself. But when you react with embarrassment, humiliation, and shame, you, that someone was being brutal to that kid. 
you have to heal it by compassion. So you view the world with compassion, the awareness, acceptance, acknowledgement of what happened with compassion to that child within you. All right? And when you deal with that, you, be, you bring it to the fore and you recognize the monsters, the scarcity, the demons, the dragons within you. you she, uh, uh, there's a psychologist called Jordan Peterson. He describes, uh, someone said, don't you think what Gandhi did was good? And he says, uh, it, was, it said something very fascinating. He says he was a man that cheated, uh, managed to uh, uh, use the word address his monsters. If you want to play out there, you have to deal with your, the stuff within you, isn't it? And we all got stuff. All right? Number three, control and responsibility. Of what, you may ask? What do you, what do you have to control and take responsibility for? Yourself. But what within yourself? Yeah. And I'll break it down even further. Your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. If you control those things and take responsibility for those things, because those things are actually within your control, and learn to do that proactively, you control the situation. If you control your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions, then you control the situation. What we humans do is we try to control the situation. Then we hope our mind is chill. We want the situation to kind of come to our side, our mind. You have to control your mind in spite of the situation. By controlling your mind, you, you have the ability to control the situation. But we haven't really played in that field. It's very important to learn how to play in that field where you control the mind and thereby control the situation. All right? If you control the situation, you can control the world. All right? Number four, people tell me this is the most difficult one is detach, forgive, let go, forget. Detach, forgive, let go, forget. Why is that considered the most difficult, challenging one? Because it's not attached to that emotion you made. Yes. So along the lines of what you're saying, if you sit here, right? All of us sit here, here. And you forgive the person or people that were sitting here. You know why it's also tough? If you forgive them, you know, for 20 years, some family member sat here, some friend sat here. As much as a friend you last engaged with 10 years ago and stopped talking to, and you have bitterness, anger towards them because it's a reaction. If you forgive them, that means for the last 20 years where you sat here, you were living in illusion. You didn't need to be here. It was all your doing. I must add at this point, because people say, you don't know what, I, sure, you don't know what I've been through. You, this, this, this. Yes, we may not, we can't change what you've been through. But as we said right in the beginning, we are learning to change our attitude to what we've been through. Because what we're doing is allowing us still to be a prisoner of what happened to us. You have to be in spite of those circumstances, not because of the circumstances, because then we're truly free. If we're holding on to it, we're saying, I will choose to be a victim forever. Isn't it? And therefore, the power and the freedom that truly gives us, that you refuse to let, by forgiving someone, is actually scary because you and I are both like birds in a cage and the door has been opened and we're saying, flip, what do we do with this power that this gives us? It's scary, isn't it? Because then you become a kid able to truly play in the world, refusing to allow people or person or situation and circumstances to cage you and keep you within in this prison. And that prison, by the way, where does it exist as we described it? In your mind, isn't it? Yeah, and we the, you don't need a physical prison anymore. You just can. I don't suggest you try it with your kid. If you wire your kid to believe there's, ju there's a jungle and lions out there, he's never going to leave the house, isn't it? In fact, nowadays you're trying to get the guy out of the house, right? Previously you had to bring them when we were young and get us back in the house. Now, just there's all these... Why is it struggle? Because he's got enough stimulation within the house to leave the house. And you're trying to get him out of the house, get that body stimulated. What is he doing? He's getting mental and emotional stimulation at some level, which supersedes physical stimulation. Back then, the party was in the physical stimulation, isn't it? Even if you wanted the mental stimulation in my day, you had to go up to the corner, as we used to call it, cafe, to play the pinball machine or the space invaders. Does that resonate? Now space invaders and pinball machines are in your house, literally. Does that make sense, right? So detach, forgive, let go, forget. Number five, move forth with purpose, focus, truth, meaning, value. 
That means as much as your pendulum is in the middle, find some purpose, the truth, some meaning, some value to aim towards so that your pendulum stays in the middle regardless of whatever forces come on one side or the other. You find yourself swimming past. I'll use the word swimming because you like have to become like water where you don't allow obstacles to slow you down and you, because you're caught up in a mindset. You flow through them because you're open to the whole infinite potential of opportunities that exist out there. All right. So you can choose, in conclusion, to be a victim of person, people, situations, circumstances, or you can choose to control and facilitate your own destiny in spite of person, people, or create, should I say, create and facilitate your own destiny rather than being a victim of person, people, situation, and circumstances. I hope you found this useful. See you all next Wednesday afternoon. All right? Okay. Any questions? All right. Thanks, everyone. Reggie's day, he's got uh, time, uh, for those who hasn't signed, and why we've got all these setups up is that we're trying to tape all these things. We're putting it onto a website so that you can access this information. There's going to be tons of information, so there's levels of information that you can access once you leave the clinic on my talks, right? Because people always ask me, where can I find this? I want some stuff. 